Okay, so th the last part of this class get to this broad framework, uh, overarching framework that will guide the rest of the semester. How do we go about deploying technology? So the, you start off by identifying environmental concerns or issues that are really critical. You can't solve everything, right? There, there are hundreds of environmental issues. Don't have the time, don't have the money uh, to do this. So you have to pick. So we can all be agreed that amongst hundreds of environmental issues, most of us will probably agree that there are few that rise to the top that are considered very universal or critical. Getting societal consensus on what those four or five are uh, will be quite difficult. But we can agree uh, that of a hundred, only a few. I mean, think about your home, your family expenditures. You spend money on a lot of things, but if you look at it closely, three or four items, food, medical insurance, and a few things will, will, will consume the most money. Each family maybe buys trivial stuff like Wrigley Spearmint. You can't blow your monthly income on Wrigley Spearmint, right? I mean, yes, it's a cost. So we're trying to find out the big rocks in the mason jar. So if we agree that human life uh, its maintenance and enjoyment is very important, as I think it is. It's, it's across races, it's across political lines. Uh, uh, human life, its maintenance and enjoyment is paramount. We can maybe, for the purpose of discussion now, although we don't have societal um, consensus, um, we can propose these following four objectives. These are called the grand objectives. These are environmental. The first is maintaining the existence of human species. I don't think anybody would argue that. Um, maybe Bin Laden would, but thankfully <laughs> we don't have to deal with Bin Laden. Okay. So amongst those who are here with us today, I think this is the top goal. Uh, maintaining the capacity for sustainable development and stability of human system. Again, uh, sustainable development means my children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren enjoy the stuff I have. I don't think anybody would argue that. Maintaining the diversity of life. We don't want to get to a point where we see a tabby cat uh, or, or a German shepherd in a zoo. Uh, it, it, we want to maintain diversity of life. So, um, and then aesthetic richness of the planet. You know, we, we, you know we, we love our trips to Grand Canyon. We love to go to Denali National Park. We don't want to destroy those. I think whether you are liberal or conservative and whether you are of any particular ethnic group, I think we can all be agreed that these are some common environmental issues we are all agreed upon. So these are called grand objectives. That's the omega sign there. However, just identifying these will not solve a problem. This is the first step. From here, we have to take these and translate them into human actions which if we repeat over and over again, will start making progress. And so we take these objectives and come up with human actions that will ensure sustainable development. Now, between objective and human action, there's a huge gap. So how we bridge this gap is we take this approach. That is, we start off with the grand objectives. You saw those four. And then we ask ourselves, what are environmental concerns that would uh, negate those objectives. What stands in the way from an environment standpoint in meeting those objectives? And once we know those environmental concerns, we ask what human activities cause those concerns and then come up with recommendations. This is what engineers and scientists do. We look at human activities that threaten the environment, which in turn threatens those objectives and say, how can we reorder things? Not eliminate, but reorder things um, and so uh, that is what this course is all about. Let me explain this a little more. Um, for example, you know, we said one of the main uh, objectives is maintaining the existence of human species. Now, what stands uh, in the way of realizing it? Well, global climate change can, you know, work against maintaining human species if Earth becomes very inhospitable. Um, Human organism damage, which means cellular damage that comes about by chemicals and radioactive stuff. Um, water availability, that could do it, right? Um, 
If you take a look, if you drive on I-35, you'd be surprised at how many new apartments and communities are coming up between San Marcos and Round Rock. Amazing. Because I've driven through this area on 35 for the last nearly 30 years. And you can see this dramatic change. And the question is, does Central Texas suddenly have a new source of water? No. We have more people coming in and more homes being built, more shops, more malls, more auto dealerships, more hospitals, but no more water, right? And you can do the math. It's not just Austin, it's all over the US. So these are environmental concerns. So we take these concerns and then ask ourselves, what are some human activities that engender these concerns? So if you take global climate change, energy use, right? When you use energy, you create uh, a climate change issue. Why? Let's say it's a coal-based electric plant. When you burn coal, oops, here we are. Global climate change, energy use is, is a human action. When you produce electricity in a coal-fired plant, when you burn coal, you release stuff into the environment. But it's not just that. How do you get coal? You have to mine it. That's an environmental issue. It takes a lot of energy to dig, whether it's a deep mine or open pit mine. You have to transport the coal, you have to clean the coal, then you have to burn it. There's a cost to it. Even the so-called clean energy, like nuclear energy, right? It, there is no smoke, there's, but guess what? What do you do with the nuclear waste? It's a huge problem. Years ago, we used to bury it deep in the desert in Nevada. Now the people in Nevada have gotten really smart. They don't want it in their backyard. Uh, the French used to bury their nuclear waste uh, in the pollination islands far away from Europe uh, in the colonial days. Well, guess what? The people in Polynesia now are awakened and said, heck no, not in our backyard. So there, you know, there's an environmental issue regardless of which energy you're talking about. It's not that coal has all problems. Nuclear energy will solve all of it. Any energy has some issues, but these are human activities, uh, rice production, ruminants, refrigeration, you know, you have uh, uh, CFCs, right? And so once we know the objective, we know the environmental concern and we know the human action, engineers can suggest action for energy use that will minimize or mitigate that. Well, we can encourage using modular product design. What does that mean? It means that in your automobile, if something breaks, you only replace that part instead of changing the whole car. As much of modular stuff you have, you can just get rid of that and keep the rest of the system. Because you have to recreate the whole thing, there's a lot more material and energy now needed. Uh, developing energy star rated products, because these are products that consume less energy, whether it's a washing machine, a dishwasher, uh, whether it's a, ref it's a fridge, Energy star rated products consume less energy as also your window panes and doors and so forth which are energy star rated have the ability to keep whatever heat or cool conditions you have in your house stay that way. Right? So these are human actions. We're not saying that you shouldn't have good homes or that you shouldn't do this or that. Engineering tries to let you keep stuff and find a way of uh, also not impacting the environment. So here is the grand uh, framework. We start off with global objectives. You need societal consensus. That seems very difficult to have. You take any uh, uh, environmental occurrence, right? The Kyoto, the Rio de Janeiro, and more famously, the Paris. Nations of the world have difficulty agreeing, and that's not limited to any one nation. Um, for, as an example, you know, you have countries like China and India in developing countries. They don't want to reduce their CO2 production because they feel the developed nations have had a two year, 200 year start doing that. Well, the developed nations also don't want to do it because they don't want to hurt their current population, right? There's no right or wrong easily available here. So societal consensus is difficult, but provided we do and we agree on some grand objectives, we can use environmental science and engineering to identify environmental concerns that stand in the way of meeting the objective. And for each of these concerns, we can identify human activities that engender or cause that concern. 
Once we have identified the human activities, scientists and engineers, which is industrial ecology, they can recommend uh, better ways of providing the same function or service or good that results in less environmental impact. So um, we, are, we are looking at sustainable development. Here's a graph. So on the y-axis you have resource use and the x-axis you have state of development. In the past we did not have sustainable development during industrial revolution. You know as we move on the x-axis we are developing more and more. But what's happening is we are using resources tremendously. It's a problem with overuse of resources. Some of these resources can get depleted. There is not an infinite amount of oil in the earth. You can, you can mine off uh, the coasts of uh, Louisiana or do fracking or do anything else, right? There is only a finite amount. Now the earth has the ability to replenish certain things like coal and oil, but it takes billions of years. Right? So you, you, nobody can wait for billions of years for something to come about. So earlier we used to develop but did so recklessly, consuming a lot of uh, resources. Uh, where we are right now is we said, okay, let's put the brakes on it. And we started doing a few smart things like hybrid cars, LEED certified homes. How many of you have seen people at HEB or Walmart bring their own bags? Right? I mean, a lot of people are conscious about that. Many companies uh, are uh, selling themselves as being good stewards of environment. So we are continuing to develop. We haven't stopped that, but we are consuming less energy. Our long-term vision is to continue to develop, but keep consuming less and less resources. And that is what sustainable development is. Sustainable development does not mean stop developing like some anti-technology people suggest let's go back to the caveman stage. It means improve your technology to where you're using less resource but providing people with more comfort. Um, so the last parts of this chapter have to do with once again defining industrial ecology and sustainable uh, development or sustainable engineering, which is what this course is all about, right? First thing we have to consider, no firm exists in a vacuum. Or no, for that matter, no individual. To have perfect freedom, you have to be like Robinson Crusoe on an island of your own. Nobody has that. Um, so every industrial activity is linked to thousands of other transactions and activities and their environmental impact. Which is why you may be, you may own land. You may own a 200 acre ranch in central Texas. It's your land, it's your, it, it's, it, you know, it, this is the most free nation on earth, but you can't dump your motor oil there. How come? Are you not free? What's the problem with that? Well, the problem is when you dump oil, it, it, it does not stay on the ground, it goes deep down. And when you go deep down, Mother nature, uh, nature or Earth does not recognize these barbed wire fences that ranches have. The oil will permeate to the entire underground water supply. right? So you do have some guiding principles by which we can engage in our free activities. So here too, we, we have to concede that. I mean, no factory is all by itself. It's linked to everything else. In the past, these interactions were not well understood. In the past, like we were making those big cars in the 50s and 40s and so forth, we developed a technology and a know-how and it all focused on satisfying customer needs. But the processes used to satisfy customer needs and their impact on the environment was not uh, within the range of decision making. So the satisfying needs of customers has always been done well, but trying to study the long-term impact on the global commons was not done well. By that, we don't mean that industry has a disdain for the environment. That's not true. It just means that since industrial revolution, development happened, especially science and technology developed at an incredible pace where we haven't had enough time to study from a systems standpoint, okay, what are all of the ramifications of what I'm doing? We use DDT to control pests. Well, at some point, you know, those pests became resistant. At some point, we 
developed a lot of chemicals uh, for well intended purposes but some of these chemicals were dropped in water bodies and those gave rise to this term called thalamide babies. Thalamide babies are deformed babies because we dropped certain chemicals in the water. We did not do so so it would have a negative impact on children. We just didn't have the know-how and we couldn't connect this with that. And we couldn't connect this with that because things were happening too fast and that's what we are saying here. While we don't know completely what the effects of CO2 accumulation is, we just are saying let's take some time, let's study well what the effects are. Uh, we need a very structured attempt to relate uh, the techniques we use to satisfy customer needs to their potential environmental impact. And it's structured, it's not shooting off the hip. It's trying to strike a balance between those who chain themselves to trees and say that, you know, tomorrow all development has to stop. Or those who laugh off global warming uh, and say that's a big hoax. If it were a hoax, not so many scientists would stake their name and reputation behind it. Um, so we, we need a structured approach. And so this structured approach to studying the relationship between industrial activity and the environment and using that as a means to aid us in evaluating and minimizing impact is called industrial ecology. So industrial ecology is the field in which we systematically study the relationship between industrial activity like product design, process design, material selection, energy use, transportation, and what are the impacts on the environment. So we learn how to evaluate and then how to redesign to minimize that.